during Advent. To consider what Advent, what Christmas really means to us, what's important to you about it. And what is it in this season that gives you joy, really gives you joy? So slow down. And I'm saying this to myself right now, by the way. Slow <laughs> down. Breathe deeply. Take time to hear and see the people around you. Spend time, waste time on those you love. Make some malt cider <laughs> or something malt. <laughs> Stare at Christmas tree for hours. Go ice skating or for a walk in the woods. Take time for joy this season, if you can find it at all to do. After all, as a well-known theologian named Dr. Seuss once said, <laughs> Christmas doesn't come from a store. Christmas means a little bit more. Christmas was a joyous time for me as a child, decorating the house, putting up the tree, eating Christmas cookies, and of course, the miraculous appearance of gifts on Christmas morning. All of that added up to an almost unbearable amount of joy inside me. But joy was also fleeting for me as a child, when the new toys broke, when my shoes got scuffed for the first time, when my favorite ornament shattered on the floor. I felt disappointed, beyond words sometimes. Joy fled away. Then there was that Christmas Eve when Dad brought home a beautiful tropical bird for my mother, a Quaker parakeet. My sister and I were so excited until the bird squeezed out of its box as Dad came in the door and we saw a small green flash fly off into a terrible blizzard. <laughs> Never to be seen again. <laughs> Mom couldn't figure out why we were so sad that Christmas Eve, staring out the picture window all evening. As a child, we live in the moment, so every new thing is experienced with deep feeling. But so is the passing of everything. Everything. And everything passes away eventually. So at that age, joy is sweet beyond words, but also shallow and fleeting, sometimes literally off into the night. <laughs> Looking back now, I still remember some of the great toys I received from my grandparents and fun experiences of Christmas past, but those aren't even close to the main thing to me. Instead, what I remember most is something that can't really be seen, a river of memory of loved ones, a river of joy shared and lost, a river of life shared with one another. And it all flows together in my mind and shines with a different kind of joy, quieter, deeper, unending. Because it is about the love flowing through those things and not the things themselves. I know not everybody can say this about the life of their family or even their own life. I've been very fortunate. Still, I think my experience points to something true about the nature of joy. Here's the thing. That love I'm talking about, the love I see flowing through my memory, isn't only the very human love that was shared between us, my family and I. That love is just as flawed, just as vulnerable, just as impermanent as any human life. But the love we shared, the love we tried to share with one another, flawed as it was, still served in some way to reveal something deeper, a deeper love that flows through everything and has its source in God, the divine center from whom all things come. We know this love in our tradition as agape, the free-flowing, unconditional love of God, a love, Jesus said, which falls as freely as rain on both the righteous person and the unrighteous person. Love even your enemies, he said, so that you may be children of God, for God's love is over everyone. We really can't handle that. We still can't handle those words from Jesus and how transforming they might be for us. As a former biologist with a continuing interest in what scientists have to say about things, I think you can see a similar metaphorical pattern in the development of the universe. From the Big Bang on, 
We're told energy and matter have continuously transformed. Over billions of years, the universe evolved to greater and greater levels of complexity, from diffuse energy and clouds of dust to the formation of stars and galaxies, solar systems and planets. The basic elements necessary for life were created within stars and scattered into the cosmos as those stars collapsed and died. And eventually, at least on Earth, those basic elements powered by the sun, by energy from the sun, combined to form the first molecules, first living cells, complex plants and animals, and finally us, <laughs> conscious beings, at least some of the time, <laughs> still dependent on the conversion of light energy to fire our brains and our imaginations. Standing back from all of that, looking back over the eons, what do we see? Not the innumerable impermanent stars and galaxies, plants and life forms which have come and gone, but a river of energy, a river of light, now become a river of life, flowing through everything, very much like that river of love we perceive flowing through our own impermanent lives. In many ways, the primary spiritual task of our lives is just this, to choose that love, to stand in that river, to try to let that love and that light come to life in our lives in all the ways we choose to live each day, each week. The true light, which enlightens everyone who's coming into the world, the Gospel of John declared. And all who received him, who believed in him, who believed and received in that, that light were given power to become children of God. So 45 years after being conquered and carried into exile at a point when hope and the chances of ever getting home had dimmed for his people, Isaiah stood in that river and felt that love flowing through the world. So he was able to declare the unimaginable. God's people shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will be on your heads, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. The river that John the Baptist stood in, calling for changed lives in a changed world, was not just the River Jordan. It was also the river of God's love and light flowing through the world, unseen until we point to it with the things we do to bring life and healing to the world. So when John sent his disciples to see if Jesus was the anointed one, Jesus didn't point to himself, but to that river of life that was flowing through him. Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, and so on. And later, a small ancient community of Christians despaired that they would ever see the coming of Christ and the realm of God in their troubled lifetimes. So James reminded them it was not the circumstances or outcomes of their lives that mattered so much, so much as whether their lives were aligned with the purposes of God revealed in Christ, which he said were compassion and mercy. What I'm trying to say, sisters and brothers, is this. It's easy right now to despair that our actions or even our lives can make much of a difference in the face of all the huge problems facing our world and all the forces that work against solving those problems. It's easy to live in fear that we are too late with too little to keep things from getting much worse when it comes to human rights, care for the environment, and so on. But it's not our task to do everything that needs to be done. Only the one thing in front of us that we can do to make a difference. And the success of our efforts is not ultimately measured by how much we accomplish, only by where we stand, only by whether we, or not we choose to stand in the river of life and choose to act in ways that allow God's compassion and mercy to move through us, to heal the world in some way that matters. To do that, to live in that way, is to know real joy, the only joy that matters, the only joy that lasts, the joy that runs deep. <clears throat> the 
each of us know that joy this Christmas season. Amen.